Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk. So if you're new to Art and Talk, Art and Talk is all about meeting artists and being inspired. So today we have an award-winning, multi-award winning photographer. He's a fine art photographer that specializes in landscape, nature, and travel. His images are beautiful. We'll be looking at a select group of them and of course diving into his art and his journey. So let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Jerry Ginsburg. Hi, Jerry. Welcome. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Good. We are so delighted to have you here as a guest on Art and Talk. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. You know, Jerry, um, you received your first camera at five. Could you share with us who gave that to you, your initial attraction to it, and what sort of unfolded initially? Sure. Sure, sure. My grandmother gave me a little uh, 127 box camera on my fifth birthday. And that really got me hooked. It's a lifelong romance. And I remember as a kid, I would get these little rolls of 127 film and take my 16 pictures. And my father would take the roll of film down to the neighborhood candy store and newsstand. And about three or four days later, bring back an envelope with 16 very shiny, very glossy little black and white prints with curvy edges. And I was just enthralled. I could not believe the capability of this. As a little child, of course, it was all very, very magical. And it became a means and, a, and an avenue to be able to freeze time and, and freeze a moment. And I, it's somewhere in my nature, I seem to lament the passage of time. I always wish I could go back. So uh, being a still photographer enables me to freeze a moment and capture it. It's, it's an instant that will never come again. And that's, that's really what I'm seeking to capture. Yeah. And, and to go out there and be in the mountains and the trees and the rocks and the lakes and see the beautiful light and wait early, early in the morning, an hour before it gets light and just wait for the light to come to me and enjoy it and see the warmth of the, the first rays of light on the earth, that is really a joy that I really have to share with other people through photography. And if someone can't be there, I can hold up an image or point them to an image on, on the internet and say, look, this is what it was like and this is how wonderful it is. Mm -hmm. And initially, were your images really focused on nature and landscape, Jerry? Is that what initially attracted to you or was that sort of an evolution? No, when I was a kid, I was in high school. I got paid for, for photographing in churches and different activities and this typical high school newspaper thing with uh, football games and so forth. But um, when I first started retiring, I've retired four times already. Um, they keep dragging me back like Al Pacino. And um, I had to cast around and, and think about what I wanted to photograph and what I wanted to focus on. And I realized that the natural beauty of America and those things that I just mentioned, the mountains and the lakes and so forth, really, I find just poetic and aesthetic, especially during the light in the right light, because the light is really everything. So I, I thought about how to identify these places. And then one day I woke up and realized that the United States government in a rare moment of, of uh, efficiency had done it for me by, by putting lines around tracts of land and call them national parks. So I started running around to national parks. I had been visited as a tourist, the first one actually 50 years ago this month when I went to Yosemite as a kid. And uh, I began photographing national parks and I had 35 millimeter single lens reflex cameras like several million people at the time. This was in just 30 years ago, actually. And uh, did about half the parks. And then I was convinced, I got a little educated and I was convinced to move up to something larger than 35 millimeter and went to medium format. And in the film world, that's defined as using film that's two and a quarter inches wide 
by various different lengths. And I chucked everything that I had done previously and I started all over again after several years of traveling the country and started doing all the national parks on larger cameras. So all in all, till I got to the end, at that time it was about 58 or 59, took me 19 years of constant traveling and hauling, rolling trunks through airports and into rental cars. And uh, since then, in the, in the intervening, what, 11 years, about four or five more national parks have been added. So now up to 63. And I seem to have become the only person of which I'm aware, of whom I'm aware, to have photographed all 63 national parks with medium format cameras. So to whatever value that distinction has, I seem to be it. Yes. And so tell us about some of the uh, hallmark moments. I mean, that's, that's so extraordinary to um, have photographed you know, these parks with the medium format. And of course, you have you've traveled around the world and you have this, a huge um, a variety of so many different images that, that you photograph so beautifully. Um, okay. If I could tap into um, some experiences that really stand out for you. So you have this heavy equipment, you're, you're in love with, with the land, with the beauty, with the mountains, with the lakes, with the clouds, with the light, it's morning or it's evening. Can you share with us um, some of these experiences that really stand out for you over these past several years? Well, one example is a friend and I, a fellow photographer and I charted a plane in Homer, Alaska, and it was the type of plane that did not have a window that opened, so we had to take the door off. And we went around the mountains and the volcanoes in Alaska for about five or six hours at 12,000 feet. And it was pretty cold until we finally got finished and said, take it back home. And I said, all right, now we had left the door back at the airport. I said, all right, we cannot put the door back on because my hands were freezing. But Alaska is a fabulous place. And a lot of it is by plane. And over time in general, I have used small planes and helicopters, I mean, really tiny planes. There, were, there was one in Port Chelan, Washington, that was so tight that I couldn't put my elbows and I couldn't move my elbows. They were close to my body and I couldn't move them out because there was no room. But um, a lot of the travel in Alaska is by plane. I've used those, I've used boats, small boats, a kayak a couple of times in the Pacific, uh, a lot of helicopters and a few horses and a few mules. I, I, I started riding, my father got me my first horseback lesson when I was a little child, but uh, a few years ago, not that long ago, a friend and I horse packed through the Sierra Mountains in California, and day one, I was in the saddle nine hours, more than I've ever been in my entire life. And as much as I, I know how to ride, I'm, a, I'm an expert equestrian, it was tiring, it was a lot, it was a bit much. On another occasion, I was standing on the shore of Naknek Lake in Katmai National Park at sunset, and there was a double rainbow. And I was very busy trying to compose a shot with the rainbow in the lake and the reflection of the rainbow. And I seemed to have been blocking the path home for about a six or 700 pound grizzly sow who was not happy, got very confused that somebody was in her way. And people were shouting at me, and I insisted on not moving until I got the shot. And uh, luckily she had patience. And uh, as soon as I got the shot, I picked up the tripod by the neck. It's about 30 pounds with everything on it and high stepped through three foot high grass and got out of Dodge very quickly. So, oh, uh, yeah, those are great, great stories. And so we really get some insight of um, just through these examples. And I know that there's, there's so many more stories of really what um, you went through and what it took and the dedication and the actual natural elements that, that went into actually shooting this, at least, you know, prior to. Yeah. So we really get that, that type of sort of overview. You have to be determined to get the shot. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Now we have a video to watch um, where 
you consider your studio, even though, of course, you know, being on a monitor and doing your editing and, and whatnot in an indoor space, but you really consider, Jerry, your studio as a landscape and nature photographer and travel photographer is really the outdoors. So before we show it, is there anything that you would like to um, set us up with before we take a look at it? Well, in this video, not particularly, but but I can comment on some of the still images that you'll show at some point. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and pull this video up. And give okay. me a second, and then we'll get this going. Oh, technology. Okay. Hello, everyone. I've been asked to uh, make a short video explaining what I do and to show you my studio. Uh, really, a studio is nothing more than looking into a computer, to mo computer monitor all day long and trying to squeeze every ounce of potential out of each digital file. So I figured that would be pretty boring for you folks to see just me clicking a mouse. So let me explain what I consider my studio to be as a landscape and nature photographer. It's just standing outside and waiting for the light, for that magical moment of light, either at sunrise or at sunset or even after sunset, when the sky lights up and the clouds light up and everything is gorgeous. Because what I photograph is nature, it's landscape, it's mountains and trees and lakes and rivers and the ocean and reflections. And that big sky and the quietness of the morning waiting for the sun to come up and just being one with nature is what makes it all worthwhile. It's a terrific way to live. It's bonding with nature and being connected to the rhythms of the earth. So hopefully this gives you somewhat of an insight into what I consider my studio to be. Thank you all very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And go to www.jerryginsberg.com J-E-R-R-Y-G-I-N-S-B-E-R-G.com to see what some of my work looks like and what's the result of all of this effort. Thank you very much. Oh, that was a great video. And I really love that, um, how you expressed, Jerry, the um, connection with nature and being in tune with the rhythms of, of nature and that, that sense of bonding. All right, it, it is, it's true. It's absolutely true. And it's all about the light. Um, I can probably make, or any good competent photographer can make a good photograph of a very mundane and pedestrian subject in great light, much better than a gorgeous subject in terrible light. So it's, it's really the light. Photography, as a matter of fact, as I learned as a kid, is, is the meaning of photography is painting with light. It's all about the light. And Jerry, in some of those um, moments where you're just, as you said, waiting for the light and, and waiting for that beautiful moment with the light, um, what have some of those experiences been like leading up to that? All those different moments, whether it was um, the beautiful initial rays of the morning light, or um, around sunset or a little bit after, as you mentioned? Well, when the sun is near the horizon, whether it's in the morning or in the evening, the sun is just above the horizon, the rays of the light are longer. I'll spare you the whole physical explanation. Um, I flunked physics in high school, so I'm trying to catch up. Um, the light is warmer. You go out in the morning and you can see that, that white things look yellow or orange and that's, that's the effect. And that's, that's what I'm looking for most of the time, not always. You don't want the ocean to turn orange. You want, you want blue. But um, where are we going with this? Help me out. Could repeat the question, please. Yes, it was, um, you know, you were, everything is about the light and capturing the, the beautiful light um, in the morning and those gorgeous rays, or it could be at sunset. And as you said, a little bit after sunset. So we're just kind of tapping into the, the moments that, that actually, you know, lead right up to it. And then your eye sees, okay, that's it. Here we go. That's the shot. The, the hour from sunrise forward and from uh, sunset backward, the last 
in rays of light. That's called the golden hour. And the one hour before sunrise and the one hour after sunset is called the blue hour. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have one image that's all blue that was in uh, Chile and Patagonia of mountains and a full moon set. I was out there standing on the edge of a lake waiting for the sun to come up about an hour early. And uh, it was very blue and there was a full moon in the sky and reflecting in the lake. And it became a very successful image and it was all blue. There was nothing warm in it. It just happened that way. It's on my website. I think it's titled Blue Moon, if I recall correctly. Your images are absolutely breathtaking. I, I've been on your website and looked through it. I recommend anyone who is a photographer or loves looking at uh, landscape, nature, photography. Uh, if you just want to travel around the world, you want to go on Jerry Ginsburg's website to see these gorgeous images. Now, is it? would you say it's correct, Jerry, that one of the major advantages of the medium format is the the depth and the dimension that you're going to achieve in your nature landscape images, that's, you know. It is, it is, it's, it's absolutely true because the larger the piece of film or the larger the digital sensor, the more detail and the sharper one can capture that detail as opposed to something smaller. So even though today the popular size Cameras are the, the full frame, what they call a full frame that's one by one and a half inches, a DSLR or the new mirrorless cameras. If I'm using a camera that has uh, two and a quarter inch film by, by three and a quarter inches wide, I can get more detail, even though it's film, which is not as sharp as digital these days. I can get more detail in an image. And as you say, the depth and the dimension, it's more real than a digital image. And unfortunately, and this is going off on a bit of a tangent, too many photographers today, and I'm not criticizing them, I just want to state what I have observed, with digital over-process it and they make it look garish and artificial. If I want to go to Disney World, I'll buy a ticket. But if I'm out in, in nature in a national park, I want to see the natural thing. That's just my opinion and my two cents. Yes, yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing that. So it's important to you to really capture what you're seeing of the beauty of nature and really not to, to alter that so much. Not to alter it, but to optimize. And, and the word that was used years ago when digital first came on the scene was manipulate. And that's a word that most photographers really dislike a lot. Uh, it's to optimize the image and get out of the, the frame when it hits the, the computer monitor, the maximum detail and color and contrast and sharpness to really convey either one of two things, what the scene was like when the photographer was there and saw it and experienced it, or to create an artistic interpretation that does not have to be realistic, as long as it's under control and it doesn't get too over-processed and just to create a, a, a work of art that may be totally subjective, which I love to do. And if you look in many public places now, you'll see streaks, uh, images hanging on a wall, frame pieces that are streaks, that are abstract. And I think that's great if that's what the artist intended to do and set out to create, I think that's great. It's wonderful. It's all in the eye of the creator and the beholder, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. and before we take a look at some of your beautiful images, they're so breathtaking. Um, can we touch upon your creative use of color, of light, as we've been discussing, of form? There's this grand sense of movement going on with, with your images and and your eye. Now, did you naturally um, have know that you had this eye? Of course, I'm sure you know it, it develops as and there's an evolution as you continue on. But did you naturally capture like the most interesting parts of what you are seeing to to bring that up into a photographic image? Well, I think if I if I understand your question. Um, I don't think I was, I was, it didn't come to me naturally. I had to work at it and, and hone the craft for many years. And I was very fortunate to have had some terrific 
uh, teachers and mentors, uh, people like David Munch, who's got over 90 books out over his career, and uh, Robert Glenn Ketchum and Joe Lang. And I've learned in Pat O'Hara, I've learned from these people and I've refined it. And, and I look now at things that I shot 20 years ago and some of them are pretty good. And some of them, I, I see them on the light box and I say, what was I thinking? So I've, I've improved and I progressed. And I think every artist goes through different phases and, and progresses in his or her career and, and changes whether uh, the, the work gets better or not is, is for the viewer to decide. But it certainly changes over time, like, as we all change over time. Uh, time was they called me Curly, so that's you know that that's one one big change. But um, it's it's a question of understanding the composition and the elements and the geometry. And as far as the color, it's when I teach I explain color contrast to take colors that are at one end of the spectrum and mix them and blend them and smack them against colors that are at the other end of the spectrum. And uh, warm colors advance and cool colors recede is one axiom. So if you see, for example, something printed with yellow letters on a blue background, those letters will pop right out and hit your eye because a warm color is advancing to your eye. And our eyes work work like that. The human I've studied the human eye and the visual uh, mechanism and the rods and the cones, and you have to understand how these things work. Yes, I think this would be a great moment, Jerry. Let's pull up some of your images and sure. look. Okay. All right here we go. The first one. Oh, that's sharp. That's good. That is Ruby Beach in Olympic National Park on the Olympic Peninsula in the very, very, very northwest corner of the contiguous 48 states. And I was there many times previously. And this was early evening, late, late afternoon. And I walked down the hill toward the beach and suddenly saw this driftwood log lying on its side with the sea stack out in the water and the reflection perfectly framed. And I ran back up to my car and retrieved another lens. I always find my, when I, after I hike two or three miles, I realize that the lens I really need is back in the car somewhere. And retrieved another lens with a very, very, very tiny aperture called F45. And despite the inherent uh, defect in using an aperture that small, it gave me the depth of field so that the log in front of me may be a foot away and the sea stack through it may be 100 yards away were both sharp. And that, that was a bit of a struggle, but fortunately I had the right tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a great, it's great national park. It has a lot of variety. It has beaches, it has rainforests, plural, and it has mountains, plural. So there's a lot to see in that park and it's very underappreciated. It's, it's lightly visited. Mm -hmm. And when you go to these parks, do you uh, initially when they were new to you, would you kind of scope it out and then um, select an ideal area and then maybe have some like subordinate, um, so to speak, other areas that you would go to or how, how did you kind of strategize it? Well, with internet, it's a lot easier. You, that everybody has a website. All these parks have their own websites and you can learn a lot. And uh, Google is often my friend in poking around and finding things. But when I first started, this was pre-internet and when it was in its infancy, I would uh, send away to these parks for the visitor package and the brochures and the maps and mark off what I wanted to see and spend the day just scouting around and looking and making notes whether uh, different scenes that interested me were best in morning light or evening light and what lenses I should use and so forth. And then I could make up uh, a self-assignment list, a to-do list, if you will, and go back over the next five or six or seven or eight days and just go slam them one at a time and cross them off my list. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing this, Jerry, because we really see all the preliminary work, so to speak, that goes into it, um, you know, as you were determining, you know, the areas that you wanted to shoot in, 
And then, of course, as you were elaborating before, all the different experiences, you know, whether it was hiking or going by boat or going by horse or the airplane situation that also is included into actually getting to these spots. So it, it's really awesome to hear all the actual, you know, larger scope of what goes on when you're actually photographing. I, I have, uh, it's a lot of experiences and, and most of them are really fun. And all the parks today, not, not all of the units of the National Park Service, but just the 63 actual national parks are in 29 different states and two territories. So it's, it's a lot of traveling around. I've, I've been through a lot of airports, believe me. Yes, yes. And also with this, Jerry, I mean, breathtaking, beautiful, that timeless moment that you say is, is what you desire to capture that that moment. Um, and also, I feel there's some like an ethereal um, aspect to this. Is, is that something that you agree with or it's something kind of within your framework when you it, it, I, I, I strive to articulate what my eye thinks is is ethereal. And I hope that people see it the same way. And I'm gratified that you do. And it's also very transitory because the light that you're seeing in this image lasted maybe 15 or 20 minutes and that's it. So it's, it's a very short lived thing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right. Thank that's you. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Oh, this, this is uh, the first time I went to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This is a spot on top of Klingman's Dome. That's the highest mountain around in the area. And it's just about on the North Carolina, Tennessee state line. If you walk 50 feet one way or the other, you'd be crossing a state line. This is a sunset over the Smoky Mountains. And you can see why they're called the, the Great Smokies and the Blue Ridge, because the blue, the steam, the vapor makes everything look like it's blue and, and very ethereal. It's a, it's a good word that you used. I appreciate that. So this is a sunset. This has appeared in many publications and catalogs and, and uh, many people have bought prints of this from my website. It's, it's been a popular image. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's um, a good moment also to note, as you were saying, that many, many of your images have been published in a variety of different publications, including the Smithsonian and uh, many others as well. I'm very proud that many of my images have been on magazine covers, on Arizona highways, and, and uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Sierra Club, Holland America cruise ships. Um, they, they've been around. They, they've been very widely used in travel catalogs and brochures, and even textbooks, actually, some of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they've been published here and there. And... Uh, Many people buy prints and posters from the website as well. Yes. Mm, just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. This is climbing backwards up a whole pile of rocks to get to a spot where I could plant the tripod and find some place to sit and wait for the light. Right, right. So first of all, it's actually getting to the spot. And then additionally, it's, it's waiting for the light. So it, it's a lot of like moments of getting there to capture the moment. There's a certain amount of prep work. You cannot arrive when the light is good. You have to be there an hour before the light gets good. And sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. And sometimes it's a washout. And sometimes there is no light and there's an early dinner or an early breakfast. It just happens that way. There's an old adage that's long before I came on the scene called F8 and be there, meaning one uh, average diaphragm aperture opening and show up. Because if you don't show up, you will not get the shot, no matter how good the light is. Right, right. All right. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this one, this is, this is very accessible to anyone, uh, anyone in South Florida. This is in Everglades National Park, right along the main road to Flamingo, there is a spot called Parotis, P-A-U-R-O-T-I-S, Parotis Pond. And I shot this many years ago in the evening 
with a sunset filter on film, 35 millimeter film. I've used that filter, I think twice. I used to run around the country with a hundred filters, but that's no longer true in digital. And uh, both of those images shot with this filter have proven to be very successful. This has been on exhibit in, uh, in Palm Beach Airport. It's been printed many times. It's been in the, in the Palm Beach Post. It's been magazine. It's been in, it's been in outdoor photography. Oh, this, this was the image, I believe. Yeah, this one first place in a landscape contest years ago in an outdoor photographer magazine. And um, this is the height from where I parked the car was almost 20 feet. So it was not too strenuous. But um, I, I, I made the mistake in those years, I wasn't as knowledgeable as I became later. I made the mistake in being there in shorts and a t-shirt. And uh, with my legs and my arms exposed and uh, about a million voracious, bloodthirsty uh, mosquitoes around, I learned the lesson that we humans on two legs are not really as high in the food chain as we would like to think we are because they're eating us. Yes. And they were chewing on me when I shot this, believe me. They love me. Mm. I must be sweet, I guess, I don't know. Yes, yes, that's absolutely it. And then again, it's showing, um, you know, to get the shot, all that it takes to, I mean, it's just, this is absolutely gorgeous. Each of these okay. images, there's just so much that it, it takes us to, and, and it just has that ability, I feel, to just, first of all, they're so peaceful and, and so beautiful in, in what you've captured. And it, it, they're, just, they're just magnificent and just really take us to that place that you experienced and how grateful we are that you captured that and then that you share the beauty of nature with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, you know, it's very gratifying to hear you say that because that's what I strive to do is to bring this enjoyment to other people. And if it, if it, some, something that you like, I feel that I've done my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I think we have one more, Jerry. Let's go ahead and, oh, there we have a self-portrait. Well, yeah, we know who that is. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to add about this before we look at that is that that's a that's a medium format camera that's a six by four and a half centimeter camera with a 400 millimeter lens and a very heavy tripod and uh, I'm very accustomed to uh, walking a few miles with that on my shoulder and primarily Jerry is it just you with all your equipment or how, how does that work out for you well these are the last many years it's either uh, myself alone or with one friend who lives in Columbus, Ohio, and has a camper and we meet, we rendezvous at different places. The last time we were together was in October in Acadia National Park in Maine, and the prior year in the Smokies and uh, in Shenandoah in Virginia. And uh, we manage, we manage, we have a good time together. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay. This is the Parker Group. I'm very clear about that because I once said to the Parker Grove, I once called it the Parker Grove to a superintendent in Sequoia National Park and I was corrected immediately. The person was very offended. This is the Parker Group of uh, gigantic Sequoia, uh, giant Sequoia trees in Sequoia National Park in the Sierras. And there are three types of redwood trees in the world. This is the, one, the, the variety with the greatest volume. It's not the tallest, but it's got the greatest cubic volume. And these were almost logged to extinction in the 19th century. And fortunately, uh, some groves of these and the, and the, and the coast redwoods were saved. And uh, it's early, early morning. The sun is just getting above the horizon and looking straight up. Uh, you can see what the perspective is with a very wide angle lens looking straight up. It's a great spot. I love to be out in the morning. It's quiet and you feel like the world is yours and the park is yours 
and everything is yours. The tourists don't come out until at least nine o'clock after they've had breakfast and the tour buses start rolling. So I'm very happy to be done by nine o'clock and go rush to a hotel and try to get the last few minutes of breakfast in the dining room or the buffet. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate you sharing this, Jerry, because you know we can almost feel like you know the quietness of the morning and just in enjoying those moments and, and your preparation and, and getting ready. And as you were saying it, it's so beautiful. It's just, it's just you and nature and just you know feeling that sense of oneness with nature and that that sereneness, that tranquility. It's fantastic when you hear the birds chirping and you hear every now and then a, a plop, meaning a, a squirrel knocked an acorn down to the ground. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's very peaceful. It's, it's, it's a great moment. It's a great experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how thankful we are because you are able to translate that feeling for us in all these different national parks and all the different places that you've traveled to around the world so that we can actually experience that too, because it's, it seems very evident that you, you convey that, you know, so beautifully and, and you know, you. with such, you know, technical precision and also with, you know, a strong aesthetic. I try, and, and you can see a lot of it is graphic as well. It's, it's the straight lines converging, and it's, it's the graphic representation, and it's also the color of the trees and the contrast with the, with the cloudy sky and the green foliage and so forth. So, it, and this image, it all works. Now, to be perfectly honest, I went out in the morning and I shot for about an hour in this spot, and this is not the only image I shot. The other 150, you'll never see. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and stop the screen share. Okay. So what have we not touched upon in your amazing career as a photographer with beauty, with nature, with landscape, with travel? Um, you know, you, you won so many awards and you have your images in so many different publications in so many different places. What, what is there now, um, place that you might want to go, something that you might want to photograph is, what's going on now that's kind of bringing some, uh, perhaps some new challenges or, or some new um, ideas kind of tinkering around that, that you want to photograph that you can share with us? Well, I love the national parks. I love running around the United States. But on the one hand, I've seen all the parks. On the other hand, if I went back I might do some better and some not as well. But what I would really like to do and I've been trying to do since COVID hit is to get to the Swiss Alps. I had a wonderful trip all planned to go from here to Zurich and drive around the Swiss Alps for three weeks. And that was in 2020. And there was no travel. There was no international travel. And I pushed it back from May to August thinking, well, this will all be over in 90 days. As we know now, it didn't exactly work out that way. So um, this year, I, I can't be sure, even if I went to Switzerland this year, I can't be sure that all of the uh, cogwheel railways and the cable cars and funiculars that I would need to get around some of the mountains around Grindelwald and, and the Lauterbrunnen Valley and, and Zermatt and, and uh, the Matterhorn are really running or running at full capacity. So what I've opted to do this year is go to Italy and I'll go in uh, October and not really photographing much of nature. There are places on my bucket list. So I'm going to Venice and uh, Capri and uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum and Serenity and hope that next year, uh, God willing, we don't have any more problems with plagues and diseases and monkeypox and variants and all this other nonsense that I can go to Switzerland for three or four weeks and go up and down the, uh, the Alps. I would love to climb the Eiger, but I don't know if, I, if my skills have eroded too much that I can no longer do it. So time is not on my side. Well, those sound like some very exciting new adventures for you and, and um... I, I imagine they will come to pass and some great images will, will come forth. I'm wondering, Jerry, if we can touch upon, we've looked at your um, some of your landscape images. You also 
on your website um, and through your uh, portfolio um, of images, you have some um, amazing floral images, birds, animals, clouds, um, glaciers, all, all sorts of different categories that you photograph. Can we touch upon some of these um, that are not landscape? Um, anything you'd like to share about them? Sure. Well, no, flowers are great. Flowers are one of nature's beautiful gems. And right behind me, you might be able to see there's a framed print of calla lilies that I shot many years ago right alongside the roadway in Big Sur and on the central coast of California. And that's been very successful in terms of not only prints, but many thousands of posters of this have been sold. Um, my posters are on walmart.com and on Amazon and here and there. But um, the flowers, as far as animals and wildlife, I am not a real wildlife photographer. There are people who specialize in this and dedicate their careers to really perfecting the art of photographing birds and mammals and quadrupeds and, and so forth. And as, as my very dear friend and mentor, David Munch, uh, was once asked by a student, tell me, don't you ever photograph animals? And his answer was my answer. Yes, as, as long as just when one happens to wander into my landscape. So I've gotten uh, moose reflections in Alaska and different things and a few birds here and there, uh, in South America especially, and uh, like that. There, there are, in, in Alaska and, and, and the Northern States, it's very easy to photograph uh, bison and moose and, and a lot of other animals. The caribou in Alaska are quite fascinating. When they trot, they seem to prance. It's a very poetic gait. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm just so enthralled in standing on the edge of a meadow watching them, I forget to actually uh, make the photograph, but they're, they're, they're quite the thing. But I'm not really a, 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 an A-list wildlife photographer. There are people who really are far better at that than I. I try to stick with, with what I know and what I've, what I've concentrated on. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've heard some other photographers say, you know, that getting sort of like caught up in the moment of these gorgeous places that you've been to with, with this spectacular ethereal light. So when you're experiencing that, and at the same time, you're also capturing the image, everything is, is coming together. Like you're, you're in that moment, you're capturing that moment, experiencing it. And is there anything that you can elaborate on as well? Like, for example, when you were saying with the animals, um, that were kind of poetically coming by. At, at one point, you were like, you just kind of wanted to, to watch it. So it's kind of a combination of being an observer, but also being in, in some type of activity. And in this case, you know, capturing photographically what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, what you're feeling. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's you have to experience it first before when I say you, one, I should put it in the third person, before one has the ability to articulate it and share it with people who aren't there, one has to enjoy the experience and, and feel an emotional connection to it and react to it emotionally. Otherwise, the, the, the attempt at articulation will most likely fail. I love that because it's really combining your great sense of technical skill and agility, and also, um, as you just elaborated on sort of like that heart feeling level and bringing that poetic ethereal sense combined with what you're actually seeing, you know, what your, what your aesthetics are with photography and really kind of bringing that in, into a marriage, so to speak. It is, it's true, it's true. And, and to watch the other creatures that are on earth with us, even though they have twice as many legs as we do, the bears are fascinating. I've seen bears in Montana and Wyoming and a lot of bears in Alaska. 99% of them are brown bears that most people call grizzly bears. They're, they're actually brown bears and they're just fantastic to watch. They're very intelligent and very clever. And uh, you just don't want to, as I explained earlier, you don't want to spend too much time getting in their way because they're bigger than we are. Right, right, yes. Are there any places that when you have a quiet moment um, that seem to resurface again and again in your mind, 
I mean, you've seen so much beauty, you've seen so much of the world, you, you, you've captured it uh, so brilliantly photographically. Are there certain places that for whatever reason just stand out and just in your mind and your memory just keep kind of coming back to you? Oh yes, oh yes. There's a waterfall in Yosemite and I mentioned, might have mentioned that was the first national park I ever visited. That was 50 years ago this month. And um, I learned from a wonderful photographer who, who was killed in a plane crash about 20 years ago named Galen Rowell. I learned a shot. There's a, a waterfall that I had seen many years ago, Horsetail Falls, flows down the side of El Capitan, which is a very famous rock in Yosemite Valley. I, I understand it's the largest granite rock on earth. Um, the light hits it for about a maximum, and it's very uncertain that it will, uh, 15 minutes a day for about five days a year. And uh, it's called the Firefall. It's on my website titled Firefall. And the, 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 the rock behind the water catches the light. And it seems that the water is illuminated from behind. And it's, it's, that's, that's the place to use ethereal. It's, it's quite an experience, quite a thing to see. And it's very hard to photograph. It needs three, three circumstances to occur simultaneously is the snowpack has to be big enough to run the waterfall. The temperatures have to be warm enough so that the snow is melting and running down the rock. And the light has to be clear enough to hit that rock at just the right moment, about 10 minutes before sunset. Uh, right around, it, it's very, uh, uncanny that it usually hits right around the birthday of Ansel Adams, who, who made a career in Yosemite uh, around February 20th and a few days before that. And it's quite a thing to behold. Now, there's a lot of talk these days about uh, the national parks being overcrowded. And I know that every so many years we get this mantra in the media we're loving our national parks to death. And several of them, the more popular ones, are now requiring restricted entry and reservations and so forth. You can't just drive in and, and walk around. And the first time that I went to photograph that firefall, I think was about 2002 or 2001, I was the only person there. I was there again in 2011 or 12 it was a mob scene. There had to be 300 people. And I was at a very famous lighthouse in Acadia years ago, and I got a great photograph, and I enjoyed the experience. And it's being out there early in the morning and hearing the buoy in the, in the ocean clanging away. And I was by myself. And I went out there just recently this past October, about eight months ago, and I got all set up ready to photograph when the light arrived. And I ended up, and the photographer to my left, both of us ended up folding up our tripods and never pushing the button because the place was so overrun with Instagram visitors and trying to photograph the sun in the sky with their smartphones. And as I asked one person, doesn't the sun rise where you live? And I got a blank stare. So um, I guess it's a good thing and a bad thing. I'm happy that so many people appreciate the importance and the beauty of the national parks, but they're becoming a little overcrowded. I did, a, I did a piece a couple of years ago with ABC TV on this exact subject. And we went to the Grand Canyon and Zion National Park and so forth. And it was all attributed to, to Instagram. And a lot of it because of COVID, people aren't traveling overseas, they're staying closer to home and they got cabin fever to a degree and people are getting out and, and running to the national parks, which, which are a great, a great calling card. And I don't begrudge them, but I think they have to calm down just a little bit. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. My pleasure. I'm wondering if we can tap into, while we still have a few more minutes, your editing process. You've given us a great range and scope of what it takes, so to speak, to, to capture these images from sort of like a to let's say W, you know, to, to get there. So now from like W to Z, once you're in your indoor studio and you're in the monitor, the computer, can you tap us into your editing process? I shoot photographs digitally in what's called raw format. 
which means that the data is unfaked, it's, it's raw, it's pristine. And I can then optimize it and make strong adjustments any which way I want. And I will then save the master file as probably a, what's called a PSD or a, it's a Photoshop document or a PSB for something that's extremely large and then compress them into TIFFs and JPEGs and send them out into the world. I'm represented by agencies and, and things get around and, and in the digital world, the stuff is out there in cyberspace. And once it leaves uh, my computer, I really can't control where it goes. But then I will file it on redundant hard drives. I, I, uh, I wrote an article some time ago called Save the Pixels because all of these hard drives that we use, whether they're spinning disks or uh, solid state or, or, or jump drives will eventually fail. Nothing is forever. So we have to be very assiduous and careful in protecting the data with redundant copies. The, the rule is, is three, two, one. Make three copies and make sure you store them in at least two different locations. Because if there's a hurricane and your library gets, gets destroyed or God forbid a house fire, you can't have everything in one place. So we need redundancy in both the, the devices and the locations. So I have a very big hard drive. When I say big, I don't mean in size, I mean in capacity in a safe deposit box in a bank vault that's supposed to be good for a Cat 5 storm. And every two or three months I rotate to add new images to that and, and, and lock them up. And uh, my website is also basically a, a cloud archive where I can just put things up there and they're in the cloud and I can pull them down. I can go on my little laptop or even my, my, my smartphone and be in the middle of Yellowstone and pull down an image if I need to, if there's a signal. Without, without a, an internet signal, none of us uh, gets much work done anymore. But um, I then, I then ship these, these images, the finished images out here and there, uh, multi, uh, save to multiple devices and to agencies who will market them, put them online in their catalogs and market them. And I make very, very small copies, little tiny JPEGs that go to our friends at the Library of Congress for copyright registration. So there, there are a lot of copies of the same thing in different sizes going to different places. It's, it's a process. Um, if you Google Jerry Ginsburg, save the pixels, you will see my, my treatise on how to archive things and save them because eventually uh, digital files will just go poof and evaporate. With film, I have five big steel fire resistant cabinets packed with thousands and tens of thousands of pieces of film. But uh, as long as they don't burn up and they don't uh, get flooded, they'll be there for a hundred years. But the digital files have to be uh, very, very, very product, pr protected because otherwise they, 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 they just evaporate and you, you can't go back and recreate the moment. If you succeeded in my initial objective to capture a, an instant that will never occur again, you can't go back and reshoot the same thing because it'll be different next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's an important consideration. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, if you would, Jerry, if you could share from your knowledge and experience any photographers that might be watching, um, maybe perhaps some um, general advice, and then those that also love nature and landscape photography, could, could you speak to them and how would you advise them? Well, it's two things. It's do your homework and learn your craft. Have patience, it's gonna take time. It's month by month and year by year. And try to improve by looking at work that is generally considered to be excellent. The Ansel Adams, the Pat O'Hara's, the David Munches, and people like that. And look at how they've composed uh, the shot and designed the frame and used light and color contrast and black and white tonal contrast. To, to get an image that to many people is successful, but don't copy somebody else's work, learn from the technique and go out 
and whatever your chosen subject is, and many people I know of successful fashion photographers and food photographers, which, which is a separate subset that's, a, that's a certainly a very defined skill set. And look at the people, the leaders in the field and their work and look what they do and then go out and practice. And the best thing that, that best piece of advice is go out and shoot, shoot, shoot and re review your work and edit your work with a critical eye. Don't fall in love with every image. Discard the ones that don't work. That doesn't mean delete them, but discard the ones that don't work and just concentrate on honing your craft to get it better and better. And it's, it's a process, believe me, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of work and a lot of dedication. So, and anybody who's interested in the locations in the national parks, you can pretty much Google Jerry Ginsburg and then insert the name of the national park like Jerry Ginsburg Yosemite or what have you and something will come up, believe me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry, that was such great advice. And this has been such a wonderful journey into your art, seeing as you see and sharing the, the beauty of the world and all the amazing moments that you've had and that you've also brought to us. Well, Leslie, thank you. It's been a pleasure and I'm, I'm very gratified that you chose to invite me and it's been a pleasure to be here and, and, and expound on these things because I really love talking about my art and what I do and what it takes and the journey that it's been. So it's much appreciated, believe me. Well, thank you. And we appreciate your amazing dedication you. as well to your art and to um, photography and to nature and, and landscape. Thank you so much, Terry, for being our guest today. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate it. Be well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching Art and Talk today. As always, we appreciate the time you take to watch our artist videos. We hope you've had a moment to watch some of the other artists from this series from the Art Acquisitions. We hope you enjoy them. We hope you draw inspiration from them. And we hope you find them informative as well. So please stay connected with Art and Talk on our YouTube channel and on Facebook. Please subscribe, like, and share. We appreciate your support. And we'll talk soon on the next Art and Talk. Until then, be well and be blessed. Bye.